these talks is I kind of outline what it takes to even become a lawyer, the different types of lawyers, and then what the McKinley County State's Attorney's Office does with respect to the field of law. And uh, you know, like Coach just said, or uh, you, you just whenever you have a question, just shoot your arm up and we can talk about that. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, so the first thing I like to talk about is, or I like to ask is, does anyone right now have thoughts of maybe I do want to be a lawyer? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thanks for participating. Yeah, we've got someone on the on the fence. Well, I'm gonna try to push you over. Buddy. Uh, so being a lawyer is awesome, uh, but becoming a lawyer is not easy, uh, so you should know that, right? Um, the first thing that you're going to do as soon as you graduate is senior class, right? Uh, sophomores through seniors. Okay, so, so yeah. awesome. Uh, so those of you that are seniors that are started already to apply or consider going to some undergraduate school, you're kind of already uh, now have committed to making the first step because you cannot get to a law school without first having an undergraduate degree. Um, now, as I told that first group, that undergraduate degree can be in anything. It can be in anything. Uh, anything from, well, I'll tell you the most common ones are political science. You get that as a major, and then you, you take a bunch of political science classes, and then you make your way into law school. Uh, however, there's majors like history, English, journalism, uh, all of those majors, it doesn't matter what it is that you declare or what you graduate with. Uh, it's like you get a BS degree or a BA degree. Uh, it really doesn't matter what your major is. Law schools don't care. Uh, they just want you to have a degree of some kind. So uh, let's say, uh, I think I picked the NIU, so let me pick U of I this time. So uh, let's say you apply and go to the University of Illinois. Um, my daughter's in Wisconsin, so she's gonna probably hate me for bringing that up. <laughs> Uh, so you go to U of I, you spend your four years there, uh, you graduate with a uh, history degree. Um, so, and uh, you don't know really much what to do with a history degree, but what you can do is apply to law schools. So after you're done and you graduate and you get that little sheet of paper, you're gonna have to take an exam. Uh, kind of like what the SAT is or ACT is uh, for undergraduate colleges and universities. Uh, the LSAT, or the LSAT, is what you need to take in order to get into law school. Uh, so, four years undergraduate, law school is usually three years long. Um, you can push through in about two and a half years, but normally law school is about three years long. Uh, so, you will take this LSAT, um, and I will talk about ranges and scores, but depending on how you perform on that, as well as your GPA when you were an undergraduate, as well as any other extracurriculars you do. You kind of put together the same portfolio, if you will, or resume, and then you apply to law school. Um, law schools, I think there's about 230 accredited universities, ABA, what they call accredited universities, uh, that have law school programs or standalone law schools that have been accredited. Based on your score, uh, you can decide where you want to go to the law school. I, uh, I went to uh, Chicago Kent, uh, which is downtown Chicago. It is affiliated with the Illinois Institute of Technology, or IIT, so this would be their law school. Paul has a law school, Loyola has a law school, U of I has a law school. Um, so uh, almost every major university also tries to have at least a graduate program of some kind in the law. Um, so, uh, the LSAT. I'm going to tell you, is the ultimate mind teaser. It is a very difficult exam for two reasons. Uh, the questions and the amount of time you have to answer each. So uh, there's some crazy questions. For example, uh, there's seven marbles in a jar. You grab three of them and they're blue. Uh, there's only two red marbles. Uh, and if you pick three times, what is the likelihood that you're going to grab a white marble? Um, logic and you play this logic game and you've got 22 seconds to figure out every single question. It's not easy. Uh, there's reading comprehension. So those of you that are like good readers, quick readers, hey, you can consider law school because trust me, you're going to do a lot of that even when you get there. Um, so logic games, logical analysis, uh, things like, okay, there's an example I used earlier when I try to repeat. 
So all cats are brown. And everything brown poos in a yard. And therefore, all cats poo in a yard. Is that, does that logically flow or not? Um, so it's all logic is what they're testing on that LSAT. And again, you don't get a lot of time. So practice tests, all that stuff that comes into play. There's even review classes and things like that that you can take to get a very good uh, LSAT score. Uh, one of the students earlier asked me, yes? Why is there so much schooling for law school? Well, in, in order, a very good question. Um, so you, what they teach you in law school, hopefully, uh, prepares you for all kinds of like obstacles, whatever a client might come to you with. Um, but the schooling part, I think, they want to make sure that in those three years, they're at least giving you a foundation where you can represent somebody should they have a crisis or a problem. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not medical school, right? Those, those guys got to keep going even further. But you can become a lawyer in literally seven years, um, the four years undergrad and the three years of law school. Um, so once you decide and you're in, uh, and I will tell you, uh, one of the students asked me, what's a good law uh, LSAT score? So anything over 160, you're getting into like the best law schools in the country. Uh, a 142 to about a 160, you should be able to get into any law school that you apply to that isn't in the top 20 or top 15 law schools. Um, so trust me when I say that uh, there are law schools out there right now that they'll accept regardless of even an LSAT score because they, they, they want to try to get as many uh, students in as possible. Um, but I would say anything between a 145 to a 160, and you got a good shot of getting accepted into a decent law school. Um, when I say decent, I say that for a reason, because those three years are hell. Your first year is uh, an incredible amount of reading. Um, you take six classes, typically, um, three the first semester, or maybe four, and then three the second semester. And I will tell you that almost every single law school across the country, the first year, it's, it's the same curriculum. You're going to take constitutional law. You're going to take criminal law. You're going to take property law. You're going to take civil procedures so you learn how a courtroom works and what motions and things like that you have to file. And usually, after that first year, if you haven't thought about it by then, this is when you need to start thinking, and this is good for you, what kind of law do I want to do? Um, so I always tell people, you don't even have to make that decision until your third year of law school, if you don't want to. Uh, you can just keep writing, just, I'm going to get the sheet, and then I'm going to decide, all right, you know, I like being in a courtroom, or I like transactional law, or I like property law, or I like money. I just want to make money, right? I didn't do all of this and go to seven years of school. I want to make some money. So you can choose, usually by your third year of law school, what classes you want to take so that you specialize in that particular field. For example, uh, tax attorneys. So tax attorneys make a ton of money, a ton of money. Boring work, numbers, if you're good at math, which most law students are not, uh, it's a perfect, uh, a perfect area of law for somebody to practice. Uh, you save your client a ton of money in tax obligation, your client pays you a ton of money for doing that for them. Uh, so that's tax law. Uh, property law, you, you hear, uh, if, you, if you follow real estate, right, there's always a lawyer that has to sign off on these real estate transactions. Um, they're never in the courtroom. They're usually at title companies just signing their names um, I uh, never thought I was going to do criminal law. Uh, never. I, I, uh, I was uh, a little different than most. I, I didn't go to law school in my 20s. I waited until I was, a, you know, even though I look like I'm 28 right now, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not. Um, so but I decided later in life, I was like, you know what? I, I worked in my industry, which was in finance, and then most of the, my industry started becoming law firms. So I was like, well, I have two choices. Either hire a lawyer, or I really wanted to be one my whole life anyway. Let's go. So I went. Um, 
the second year in law school, I, uh, I tried out for what they call these mock trials, and I understand you guys do mock trials in here, which is really, really cool. So if you like those, that should tell you that maybe I do like this law thing. If you like taking parts in arguments, and I've been married for 21 years, so I will tell you I am an expert arguer, uh, just with my wife alone, uh, but I don't win any of those. Uh, however, in a courtroom, I'm better. I have a better track record than I do at home. Um, but what happened to me really was my law school had this highly ranked trial team. And uh, so I went and I was like, well, you know, let's go try out. And, and then I made this trial team and I was like, wow, this is cool. You do all these mock trials and, and different you know, types of law. But you know, uh, no matter what, I was always in the court. So I decided, all right, I'm doing this. I, I'm going to try and do whatever law I practice I don't want to be in a boardroom, I don't want to be in a cubicle, I don't want to just look at papers or contracts. I want to be in a court. So if that's the way you kind of feel as you exit law uh, or the law school, then really there's two choices that will immediately get you into a court. One, you become a prosecutor. Two, you become a defense attorney. So criminal law, you're I would say criminal law is the one area of law where you're not going to be in a boardroom. You're not going to be talking about contracts and stuff like that. But you're going to be addressing, you're going to usually be handling inside a courthouse or sometime. So when I realized that, I did an internship uh, out here um, in the state's attorney's office, and I knew, I was like, this is, this is awesome. Uh, this is what I want to do. Um, so, I never thought, like I said, that going into law school, that this is the area of law I wanted to practice in. By the time I was done, I was that deep in it. So again, you don't have to make a decision until your second or third year of law school. Uh, so criminal law, um, property law, uh, tax law, um, civil law. There's, there's so many different areas. So some people are like, well, I mean, I want to be a lawyer, but I'm not sure what kind. And I can't stress enough, you don't have to know. You can figure that out over time. You don't have to know. Um, now, once you decide, uh, and if you do decide that it's criminal law, you can go into one of two areas, right? You can either be prosecution, the right side of the law, the right ones, and then you can be a criminal defense attorney. And you can make a ton of money doing that. So, Again, your concern is, well, uh, I've got to pay off these loans, or I didn't go to law school so I can just make a little money, so I want to do criminal defense. Because you can actually charge a ton of money doing that. Um, in the criminal prosecution world, which is where I kind of live, uh, we, it's, you have different levels. You have, uh, in my office, the state's attorney's office for McHenry County, we will prosecute any crime that happens in our county. So, if it happens in Cook, we don't go near it. If it happens in any other county, we're out of it. Now, there are times that we will cross over from county to county, but that's very rare. Um, so if a crime happens in McHenry County, uh, one of the departments usually will fill out a report or a citation. Um, there's two types of crimes. I don't know how much has been covered with that with you, but there's a misdemeanor, and then there's a felony, right? Uh, anyone know the difference? Very good. Very good. Exactly. A felony crime, you can be sentenced for one year or more in uh, prison. <coughs> in prison, because they're not going to keep you in the McKinley County Jail for a year. So usually you will stay there until your trial, and if you're found guilty, you then get shipped away to prison to serve that year or more. Uh, so misdemeanor, 365 days or less, right? We're going to say that. There you go. 365 days or less, you committed a misdemeanor. <clears throat> Examples of misdemeanors. Uh, a simple battery, right? You get into a fight and you hit somebody. Well, that defendant has been charged with a battery. A DUI. Um, domestic battery. So you get into a fight, but you're in a relationship with that person, or you live with that person, or that person's related to you. 
that becomes a domestic battle. Uh, traffic citations are even one level below that. Anyone know why a traffic citation is different than those other misdemeanors? Because you can't go to jail on a traffic citation. All right, so there's no jail for that one. It's usually just a traffic citation or a moving violation or a vehicle or something. So uh, I am the chief of the misdemeanor division in the McHenry County uh, State's Attorney's Office. So I've got seven, eight attorneys that work for me, and we handle all of the misdemeanors that come from. So to follow it through, let's take, for example, an officer uh, pulls someone over for a DUI, and they run them through these field sobriety tests, and they determine that they're gonna charge this person with driving under the influence of alcohol. So that citation gets sent over to our office. At that point, the department no longer handles the prosecution. I think some people have that conception that, oh, the police keep doing the Work on. No, not at that point. They're done. Now the state's attorney takes over. And the state's attorney, and that's very important, especially in the cases of domestic batteries, because sometimes in a domestic battery, uh, the victim will call 911 and, all right, you know, this is what happened, and he hit me, and, and I'm hurt, and whatever. And then now, two months, fast forward two months, and they're in love again. So uh, I, just want, I, I, I just want this draw. I just, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Well, you don't get to do that. Because once the police got involved, once there was a report written, now there's a domestic battery that needs to be prosecuted. So it was difficult, and I talked to the last group about that. You know, they want to talk about the burden and all of that that you have to prove in a criminal case. Anyone know what the burden is in order to find somebody guilty in a criminal offense? I'll give you the first word, beyond Anyone? A reasonable doubt. So if you, you've heard that term, that means you're in the criminal world. In the civil, in the civil word, in the civil world, it's called preponderance of the evidence. In other words, more likely than not. So all you have to do is be at 51 percent, and your guy wins. Anything under 51 percent, your guy loses. So in the criminal world, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Defendant doesn't have to do anything. In the case of the domestic batterer that I just mentioned, if we go to trial on that case, they may just sit there the whole time during the trial and not say anything because they don't have to. The burden's on the state. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this person committed this offense. Now, imagine you're a juror, and here comes a prosecutor and he's explaining to you on this day, this is what happened, blah, blah, blah. And we don't have the victim. But sometimes a juror might say, well, this is not here. The victim doesn't care. So maybe we don't care either. So as a prosecution, we have to make them care. Like maybe photos, maybe the 911 call, maybe giving all of that evidence to somebody would make them think, well, no, something bad happened here. And we can still find it. So it's not very easy, though, when you don't have victims to cooperate. So that makes those cases tough. <clears throat> in the case of a DUI, um, a lot of times uh, you guys might have a perception of what somebody looks like when they're drunk, right? Uh, they stumble, or they blink real slow, or they slur their words, or something like that, right? Well, now we're in the day and age of video. Every squad car has a camera on there, they pull over somebody. The jury's going to watch the video of the stop. If the guy isn't falling all over the place, a juror might say, well, he doesn't look that drunk. So I don't think he's drunk. We have to again prove that not everybody looks like they're falling all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, burden sits with the state on all of those cases. In the cases of felonies, those are um, aggravated batteries. A uh, firearm, you used a gun and you pointed it at somebody, right? Uh, possession of a controlled substance, those are felonies, drug cases. Uh, intent to deliver, things like that. Um, an aggravated DUI, so you were drunk and you killed somebody. So 
of it, but it's not a regular DUI. Now there's been some great bodily harm done, it becomes a felony DUI. So that's the difference there between those two fields. Now, I will tell you, no matter which group you end up in, in the prosecutor world, you're going to need trials. Uh, you're going to need trials. Because defendants, in some cases, they have nothing to lose. You know, I'm going to go to jail, so I might as well run this trial and see if I can win because I don't want to go to jail. Uh, so you will be on your feet. You will be in courtrooms almost every single Monday. COVID kind of screwed it up a little bit, but every single Monday, we have anywhere between three to five trials going on. So, between the felony courtrooms as well as the misdemeanor courtrooms. All right? Any questions yet about the categories there? Now, of course, the way justice works is you have to have the other side. So there's defense attorneys. Now, most defense attorneys start out as prosecutors and then cross over. So you learn what to do. <coughs> Excuse me. You learn the cases. You learn what the police are doing well. And you say, all right, I'm going to defend this guy because this person didn't do that. Coach, can I get a bottle of water for you? Yeah, let me see. I have. Well, if you don't. I have like a flavored one if you want. Is that Whatever you sure? Yeah. Need something to drink. Sorry. You're taking yours. Uh, peach. Am I taking yours? I have fun. No, I, that's why I brought this. It's good. <clears throat> So, the criminal world, again, you're gonna be on your feet, you're gonna be doing trials. If criminal defense is your world, you can make a lot of money. A lot of money. Um, a DUI could charge $5,000. A domestic battery, $5,000. Just to defend. And the best part about being a defense attorney is, you get paid whether you win or lose. You know, you can't guarantee that this person is going to be found not guilty. You can't guarantee that, so you can get paid in the orders. All right? Now, if you decide that criminal law is what you want to do, I will tell you the best thing would be <coughs> our internships. If you can get in uh, to one of the state's attorney's offices, one of the best things to do is work over the summer. Do an internship, realize whether or not this is something that is, is, is really something that you'd like to do. If so, at that point, you can go ahead and work on your side of criminal defense or uh, prosecution and still end up doing those internships while you're learning what to do there. Um, in my office, we've got nine felony attorneys. We've got eight misdemeanor attorneys. So it tells you that criminal law never goes away. It's a field that will always be there, but unfortunately there will always be. <coughs> That's the job security that comes from that. Um, so you become a lawyer, you decide you're going to do criminal law. One thing that I think you, you should think about when you get into this field is what side means what? Do you like the Excuse me. I think I talk too much today. <laughs> That's me day one of school. Right. <laughs> um, do you like the justice side? Helping people. Victims. Things like that. Does it matter to you? If so, that's the side you want to work on. I guess I could wrap up by saying uh, I never thought, like I said, that I would end up doing criminal law. But it's been the most gratifying thing I've done for the last three years. <coughs> Open up to questions. Anyone? We got a question about what here. Anyone know what that is? Jury selection. So how do you how do you pick a jury? Um, usually people get cards. Twenty five people show up, and we have to ask questions. Right. Um, one of the things that the early group asking is, have the questions changed? Or what questions do you ask people? Well, nowadays, we want to ask people questions like, do you have any animosity towards the police? Some people may just not like the police. Oh. Oh. Still you? Yeah, he goes with me. Thanks, James. Um, 
some people may just not like the police. So we don't want those on the jury. Um, some people may say, like the defense attorney may say, well, we don't want people who have relatives that are police officers. Because they're not going to be good for my, my uh, client. So both sides, right, will we'll ask these questions of the jurors. And then at some point, if you've asked enough, you get these 12 selected. 12 jurors will be selected. You start your trial. Have you guys done a mock trial yet? Not yet. Not yet. OK. So you start with opening arguments or opening statements. They should be not arguments. And you basically say, this is what I expect this trial to be about. You know, you're going to hear from this witness. This is what they're going to say. And by the end of the trial, we'll have met our burden. And we're going to ask that you find this person guilty. Um, the defense may stand up and say things like, members of the jury, they have the burden. They have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And by the end of this trial, they're going to fail. And so find them not guilty. Then you have evidence. Prosecution has to put on a case in chief. So we will bring, for example, in the case of the DUI, we'll bring the officer and say, you pulled this person over what? And then what happened? Oh, well, I saw his eye with a bloodshot and, and glass. And then he did bad on the field sobriety test. So that's why I charged him. And here's the video. The defendant doesn't have to do anything. They have no burden at all. So you hear that a lot, like, uh, you know, do I plead the Fifth Amendment? Well, you don't even have to do that. In a criminal case, you don't have to testify at all if you're the defendant. So sometimes in voir dire, a defense attorney may ask a juror, hey, listen, if my guy doesn't say anything, if he doesn't testify, are you going to have a problem with that? You know, in the case of a domestic battery, Maybe the juror wants to hear the guy say, I didn't do it. I didn't touch her. Well, if they're not going to testify, the defense wants to know, hey, are you going to have a problem if my guy doesn't take the stand? Because again, by right, they don't have to do anything. So questions like that come up in voir dire, and usually by the end of it, questions the judge asks, questions we ask, questions the defense asks, you end up with 12 jurors in one hall for the jury. How do you get picked? Well, after all those questions, if I don't like juror number four, in front of the judge, we'll say, judge, we think and excuse this seat. If you don't like juror number eight, whatever, they just move around until you end up with your 12 jurors and your one alternate. And that's when you start the trial. So that's usually what voir dire, it's a fancy French term that just says jury selection. Anything else? Yeah. So you said you were the chief, right? Yeah. And then there's 800 people working here. That's right. Do you guys consider yourself like a family, or is it like business, like co-workers? Uh, so I probably, uh, and I'm going to tell, tell you this because none of them are here, I'm the best boss in the world. <laughs> and, uh, we always have fun. You have to. You have to. This job can be um, trying. Uh, you see some things and read some things that are just tough, you know. Um, child sex abuse, that, those are tough reports to read, you know. Um, cases where after you met with the family of, I have a, we have a defendant in, in our county right now claiming he was trying to kill himself. He runs his Jeep over across the lane and he ends up killing the driver and the passenger of the other vehicle. And he walks away. So when the officers asked him, they're like, um, well, what happened? Was this an accident? He said, no, I'm trying to kill myself. Well, if you're trying to kill yourself and you took the intentional move to drive your car over to the other lane, you charged him with murder. Because you had the intent to cause some harm and it resulted in death. For me, with those families, I mean, it's tough, right? They did nothing wrong. They were driving on the road, on the way home from work. So it can be some some, some real tough things to read through, but uh, we do have fun. Uh, we do have fun. When the light switch goes on and the trial starts and there's a jury, though, yeah, we take it very serious. Because again, we know they don't have to do anything. We have everything. 
I'll get to you in a second. I saw this thing. You got What is like one of the stranger cases you've had? Yeah, so I, I was asked that earlier, and I don't think my strange case got enough, uh, like, yeah. You know, it didn't. I thought it was weird. I mean, so, uh, yeah. Let's see if I can go with another one. Um, so we had this, I guess. Strange as in, like, outcome was weird, or strange the facts are weird? Like, the facts are, like... Oh, well, then I have to use the one. Okay. Okay, so so this guy uh, claimed that he was a veteran, and he's riding the metro, and he tells the conductor, I want the discount. And the guy says, well, I need to see a military ID. And the guy says, I don't, I don't have a military ID. He goes, well, I can't give you the discount without the military ID. Long story short, the guy felt insulted. Conductor walks away, nothing happened. Now, the conductor walks by again. This guy grabs his phone, and on his phone, he had this, like, he was a painter. And the name of his company was Patriot Painting, right? And he's explaining to the guy, look, that's the name of my company. I'm a vet, and you see that's the name of my company. The guy's like, look, I can't give you a discount. We already talked about this. I need a military ID. The guy flexes, comes at, a guy, at, at the conductor, the conductor punches him right in the nose. Right in the nose, and lays the guy out. And he had these two friends with him, and I use the term friends loosely, we were just riffraff. Uh, he comes in, the, we meet with the victim, because it was a battery, you know, he, he got punched, he brings this guy in, he starts telling us how he was in Vietnam, and all his friends were this, and. You know, and he knows how to stand up for himself. And he's lucky because these hands are lethal. And that the other guy was lucky that he didn't unleash these lethal hands. Well, we did the math. He was seven years old when the Vietnam War was over. Uh. We're like, I don't know about any of this story anymore. So he was so full of him, these stories. He believed them. He was clearly lying. And so when we put on the trial, my co-counsel and I literally are going in there like, okay, there was a bad week that happened. It, was, it got some news because Metro was involved, and the Metro wave was involved. And they want to know what happens when a conductor punches one of their riders, you know? So we had to go to trial instead of dismissing it, even though my co-counsel and I were like, okay, we got to lose this. Because this guy's an idiot, and he's clearly <laughs> full of it, and so we got to lose this. So we sit down, we put them on, and the first question my co-counsel says is, all right, did we agree we weren't going to And we're going to let this guy pretty much hang himself. So we said, what happened? And he starts with this. You know, and then I positioned myself, and I this, and that. And he took off his hat, and he had like USS whatever, and he puts it right there so that everyone in the jury can see that he's this, this veteran, right? No one. No one bought his story, and thankfully he didn't come back. He's not guilty. And this poor conductor, like, he, was he defending himself? No, because the guy didn't really swing at him. He did commit a battery, but as I was telling the group earlier, sometimes justice happens and you lose, right? Because there really wasn't a crime there. The battery occurred by law. We still have to try it. So here's this guy, literally lying to us. Um, and thankfully that came out during the trial. So that's one of the screens. Uh, yeah. What's oh, I'm name? sorry. Do you, do you mind if I go there? Oh, um, uh, is it like long hours? Like okay, so if you practice civil law, chances are you're going to be spending a lot of time in, in your office. Um, I will tell you also, if you graduate from law school in the top 5% of your class, you're going to end up getting really good offers right out of law school. I mean, I'm talking $180,000 a year offers right out of law school. And you will work 20 hours a day. And those big law firms put you through a lot. So prosecution, we're done at 5 o'clock. We go home, usually try not to take homework uh, work with you. 
our weekends, if we have a trial going on Monday, we usually prepare over the weekend for that. But it's not as bad in the, in the criminal field because you're only working when the courthouse is open. Yes? What was your favorite case you've ever done? It's the one I'm on right now. Uh, and I don't know how it's going to play out, but it's a very interesting case where uh, um, two elders of a church, uh, um, one of their congregants came and confessed that uh, he was, he was um, molesting his daughter. And these elders, uh, because it was confessed to them, saw it as, well, this is private. This is a private conversation. So they did not report the incident. They did not report it to the police. So this was back in 2006 when this happened. Fast forward to 2018, uh, that young girl was molested for another 11 years of her life. And she then walks in and tells these elders, do you remember what my dad said to you when I was six years old? And they say, yeah. And she says, well, he's been doing this to me for all of these years. So we, of course, arrested the dad. The dad has been tried and found guilty. And he's spending 45 years, I think, in Pontiac. What was interesting about it was during his trial, is when one of these elders said, this is what happened. I knew about this back in 2006. Well, there is what's known as a mandated reporting law. If you find out about child sex abuse, you have to report it. If you're a teacher, if you're in the clergy, if you're a 911, uh, if you're a, a emergency room nurse or something, and you see abuse all over a child, you got to report that. So our what we decided to do is our office decided we're going to charge these two elders and say their failing to report resulted in this happening to this young girl. Now, it's just a misdemeanor, right? It's, uh, they're charged with a misdemeanor. They're not charged with a felony like the father was. But what's uh, so fascinating about the case to me is we are arguing whether or not there's a privilege between the confessor and his priest. Is that allowed? Is that discussion allowed to come out? So the defense argument is, it says it right here in the statute. Right there, it says that the clergy can exercise a privilege and they don't have to share it. Well, my argument is, no. You could have just called whoever, whatever police department and said, listen, there's this address and we believe there's a girl in danger. And then the police can respond, and they can investigate, and they can do whatever they want. And now if they go back to the clergy and they say, hey, you called the police, who told you this? Well, then the clergy could be argue privilege. I can't tell you who told me. Then they could say, well, what did they admit to? I, don't, I can't tell you, because that's privilege. So my argument is that they're not mutually exclusive that you can still be a mandated reporter, in the case of a child sex abuse case especially, and not violate your privilege of confidentiality. And at least this girl, if the police had the opportunity to investigate it in 2006, would not have gone through what she went through for 12 years. Um, so the reason why I think uh, it's also fascinating to me is because uh, these are elderly gentlemen. Um, so I've been called the most heartless prosecutor because one of them is 89 years old. So I'll wear that with pride, I guess. Um, so yeah, there, there's that's an interesting case that's going on right now. Yeah. Any others? How many want to be a lawyer other than you? Anyone? No one? No? No interest? Okay. Okay. Hey, I mean, I'm telling you, if you like to argue with people, your friends, and you win the arguments, consider being a lawyer. <laughs> if you're winning them, right? Uh, I also tell people if you have what's called POP, the power of persuasion, you want to be a lawyer. Um, 
because it's not easy getting up in front of 12 people that you've never seen before, they don't know you, you don't know them, and you've got to convince them that your side is right. And trust me, that defense attorney also knows that every witness you put up there, they're going to cross-examine them, they're going to poke holes in their story, and they're going to say things like that as well. So, but if you have that uh, gift of gab or power of persuasion, or if you piss off your parents to the point where they can't take it anymore, <laughs> consider being a lawyer. Those, those, it's, a, it's a really uh, gratifying profession. You asked uh, as well about the case. Those hours can really pay off when you help a victim out. You know, they, they, you feel good. You feel good about it. Um, and you can make a trauma on you. So there's that too. Anything else? You got a couple yeah. minutes. Do you, like, ever feel like kind of guilty about how satisfied you are putting someone down. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, for a second, Yeah. maybe, but that's about it. Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm glad you're gone. So we like to say uh, there's three ways you can come into a courtroom, the judge's way, the front door, and then the jail door. So when you send them by door number three, that means you've done a good job. But again, justice sometimes is also, I don't want to win this case. I don't, and I didn't want to win that one. Last one? Um, you ever involved with the murder case? No. So I told the last group, uh, maybe it's a good thing, but in McKenna County, we're not Cook and we're not Lake. Cook and Lake probably have five to ten murders a week. Uh, so let's keep it that way, huh? Um, we just don't get that many. I had an attempted murder, and it was on video, on cell phone video. Oh, yeah, the guy, the guy knew that this guy was going to fight him, so he props his cell phone video, and then he's talking to him over here, and his buddy, and they were good friends, his buddy uh, goes to his room, grabs a knife, and literally just right in the gut, right? And it, I was really excited about going to trial. He played it. So, yeah, and I should also throw that out there. The cases that are not good for us, where the evidence is so great against the person, they'll never go to trial. They'll just plead guilty and figure something out. So. Mm -hmm. nice. You guys uh, have a great weekend.